Yeah, thank you very much. <clears throat> so maybe, uh, as I recall from last time, <clears throat> Uh, we uh, talked about regularization. <clears throat> mm-hmm. Of a uh, Kepler problem. <clears throat> for negative energy. And following Moser. <clears throat> and what we seen is that <clears throat> we can embed, after reparameterization, the capital flow into the geodesic flow of um, S2. <clears throat> Namely, what we first do, we interchange <clears throat> um, fiber and base. <clears throat> and uh, this is from T star R2 to T star R2. And then we, Im- uh, we embed this into T star S2. <clears throat> and now there is a different, uh, a related but slightly different regularization, which is uh, due to um, Levi Civita. <clears throat> so maybe, maybe um, for the topology, as also after regularization, <clears throat> So the, the regularized hi- hypersurface <clears throat> um, in T star S2, this is um, because we have the geodesic flow. Uh, the, so the geodesics is determined by a point and the direction. So this is the, the unit, unit cotangent bundle. Um, unit cotangent bundle. Namely, also. so geodesic determined by starting point and starting. Unit direction and this the, the unit um, tension bundle of S2, this is diffeomorphic to mm, RP3. Um, and so the universal cover, or the double cover, is S3, and this Levi Civita regularization actually corresponds to the double cover. Hmm. It's a kind of a double cover. But actually, Levi Civita is, is older. <laughs> so, um, is, and it, it was even used before Levi Civita. So it, it um, so I think this was um, figured out by Jean Sini at one of his people in his group that um, this, you can already find this regularization in a paper by Gourzon in the, in the uh, 19th century. Also it's already used by Gourzon and if you go back even more, then you can find it basically already in the work of Newton. <laughs> and so I, I would like to go back a bit to Newton. <laughs> and uh, implicitly, Newton. <clears throat> and I would like to explain a bit how Newton proved that um, you get the, the solutions of uh, this Kepler-Hamiltonian Kep- ellipses, this Kepler ellipses, <clears throat> because uh, this is a proof, it's a quite geometric proof, 
which you usually don't do in the, in, in the, the lecture. So, in, so, so after Newton then, so Leibniz and the Bernoullis, they had this calculus and they did everything with calculus. But Newton had a more geometric uh, idea. And this, but the way I explain it is not, you, you don't really find in <laughs> Newton's Principia. So this is kind of, um, fo we follow um, interpretations by Arnold and Arnold wrote the whole, uh, basically a book about this and the Needham and following uh, Arnold Needham. Uh, so maybe re recall the following thing. <clears throat> so in symplectic uh, geometry, we like cotangent bundle. <clears throat> so we have uh, as a cotangent bundle. This has the <clears throat> um, has canonical canonical um, symplectic form, and because it has a canonical one form, namely we have the canonical one form. Uh, so the Liouville one form. So if we have um, if n is a manifold, and so this is physics term, this is the configuration space. And then we have a T star n. This is the, the physics called the phase space, the cotangent bundle. And if you have a point here, then so you can do the following thing. So here we have n. So here we have a T star n. So we have E and here we have the projection, then we um, have here the PE and then we, um, we want to compute the Liouville one form E at um, um, Xi, as a Xi is an element in the tangent space at E of the cotangent space, so LE of Xi, what you do is you first um, project, project it to um, the EPE Xi, so that's here, EPE Xi. This is, this is an element in the tangent space of E, and then you apply um, Xi to it, because Xi, uh, sorry, not Xi, E, um, because E, you can also interpret as cotangent vector in its, in its uh, fiber. So this you interpret as TPE star N. <clears throat> and then you have the dual pairing. So this is, this is just given. <clears throat> uh, so we don't need to worry anything. <clears throat> and then, so, that, so for in, in f the physical transformation, we should um, keep the co this cotangent bundle structure. So we, as omega and just d lambda. <clears throat> and actually the, the physical transformation preserved this, this lambda. <clears throat> so if we have um, um, phi from n1 to n2, then we have, um, so we have x here, so we have d phi x from Tx n1 to T phi x n2 um, and linear isomorphism and then we have the, the dual. So the dual would go from, from the dual space here to here, but then we take inverse uh, from the dual um, x n1 to t star phi x n2. And so, so let's, let's define maybe t star phi from um, t star n1 to t star n2. 
which maps <coughs> x uh, xi to phi x um, d phi x star dual xi. This and this is this is actually exact symplectomorphism. So we have d star phi, the Liouville really one form and two pullback is just gone. So everything is natural. <coughs> So we, we, should use, we should look at um, um, this kind of, of maps <coughs> so that they will automatically uh, preserve the symplectic form. <coughs> and um, now, especially if if u is in C, <coughs> open subset, and we have phi from u to v in C, um, holomorphic, then <coughs> we can write this d star phi uh, from t star u to T star V, so we have um, here um, Z W, so we map it to phi of Z, and then because everything is holomorphic, so this is um, this conformal, then the then this this part, so I, I, I now I just take this is just a complex derivative. The complex derivative defined by um, square. So, so this is a complex number. So this is just complex multiplication. Or equivalently, I can write this as phi of z <coughs> um, w divided by phi prime z bar. And bar is, is complex conjugation. So now Newton, or yeah, or this, this kind of people, they look at the following double cover. Mm. So we have L from C to C, we just map Z to Z square. Here, complex. And then <coughs> the this, so this also this also referred to as a contra gradient. Also this this map here, maybe let's call this L. So this is this D star L um, from T star C to T star C, <coughs> this maps <coughs> Z W to, to Z square, and then we take uh, W divided, so the derivative is 2 Z, and so we have to take um, complex conjugation, so it's 2 Z bar. And this is, this is, <coughs> these are is our old Q P. So if if you if you look in some literature, then you will find on the Levi Civita transformation. And um, sometimes they, they do it not quite like this. Sometimes they have here a two and here no two, and then it's it's not symplectic, then it's symplectic up to a factor. <laughs> but if you if you do it like this, then um, by this general um, Nonsense. It, this is this is symplectic, symplectic map. So, and, or you can, if if you if you talk to an astronomer, he will just tell you. So you have to change coordinates. You have to replace q by z square and p by w divided by two z bar. <coughs> so it's kind of a fancy um, coordinate uh, cha uh, change of coordinates. <coughs> 
And now let's do this change of coordinates and let's do it for the capital problem, but let's already do the regularized capital problem. As we when as of recall from yesterday, so we had the, the Kepler Hamiltonian. Uh, I had H Q P, this is one half P square minus one over Q. And then uh, yesterday we had here plus one half. Maybe let's be today a bit more general and just add plus C equals zero for, but, uh, uh, for negative energy. So let's suppose C is bigger zero. So then if you take C to the other side, it's minus C. So this is um, less than zero. And then um, we already multiplied this by Q. So, so we had K um, Q P. This was Q H Q P. This is um, one half. Um, P square plus C Q minus one. And now let's just do this change of coordinates. So let's write Z square for Q and W divided by two Z bar for P. The mathematician would say we, we pull back, <laughs> but uh, what well, astronomer has we change coordinates. <laughs> so, uh, so we just k, and now we plug in for p w two z bar, and for uh, uh, sorry sorry for q is um, z square, and uh, p is w divided by two z bar, and this is <clears throat> Um, one half, um, so we get here p square, so it's w square divided by uh, four um, z square plus c, and then we have q square, so this is another z square minus one, so this is, um, so we get one over eight w square plus c z square minus one. So this is, um, this, you, this is, um, you can think of this like kinetic energy. Now we, now we have one over eight, so, so, so we have maybe a bit uh, scaled down. So, so that's, some people don't like so much this one over eight and for that reason they put here, take away this two and put it here, but, and then they put this factor four into the symplectic form, but it doesn't, it doesn't matter. So, so up to, up to, up to some uniform scaling. <clears throat> and this is, this is now just the um, quadratic uh, potential. So this, and so we have two coordinates, so, so you can think of this as two uh, uncoupled harmonic oscillators. This is the Hamiltonian of two uncoupled oscillators. So you can, now we have, um, all these things are very close. So Kepler flow, geodesic flow on S2, and the flow of two uncoupled oscillators. <clears throat> and then, <clears throat> then how did Newton figure out the Kepler ellipsis? So now for the uncoupled oscillator, um, this is easy 
to see the solution. So here the solutions are also ellipses. But there is a difference. Because the Kepler ellipses, they have the, the focus of the Kepler ellipse is the origin. And here is the, um, the, the origin, the, the center of the ellipse. Um, so, so, the, so the solutions, these are ellipses with origin center. And now, um, this is some kind of element, elementary exercise. Now you can um, do some elementary geometry and see that this map Z to Z square, this maps ellipses with um, the origin in the center to ellipses with um, origin a focus. Hmm. And then, as a result, this is some elementary geometric. In fact, so this L from C to C, Z goes to Z square, this maps this kind of ellipsis to. So. <clears throat> Ellipse <clears throat> with origin in the center to ellipse with origin focus. That's how Newton um, solved the Kepler problem quite geometrically. <clears throat> so that, there is one, <clears throat> one exception. So the solution are ellipses or um, the limit case is just um, intervals. <clears throat> And this. Hmm? So, so degenerate ellipses. And this, these here, now, these again correspond to the collisions. <coughs> uh, but it's now different than in the, in, as by Moser. By Moser, you had some trampoline. So if they collide, they bounce back. But here we have this two to one map. So um, using this two to one map, this, this uh, direction is actually corresponding is identified with this one. So if if you if you go back this two to one, this corresponds just to like this. <clears throat> so that uh, but uh, so this this. Is this Lebesgue also regularizes? So also after this, it's you make one more thing. You go to double cover and regularize. This here, um, they they are mapped to this, and then just go back. So these are these are the collisions. Good. And <clears throat> so actually, this so, so so we can now think of this. L <clears throat> to 
uh, here, here I was maybe a bit too bold because I should, I should here remove a little bit because um, I, I divide here by set bar. So, um, so I have to take out something. So, so Z, Z is in, in C about zero and W can be anything. But you can extend this map a bit. So you can extend this map to C2 minus zero and then you get the double cover to the cotangent bundle of S2 where you remove the zero section. <clears throat> and because now you can think of this as with the interpretation of Moser behind, you, th you think of P as the base and as Q as the fiber. And if you, if you think like, like this, as so you map, you map this, this is now the, the, the base point and this is the fiber point, then uh, this extends to um, uh, um, a map from C2 minus origin to T star S2 minus zero section. <clears throat> and note, so now I just um, remove the order, so the, the map um, L from C times C zero to um, T star C, um, now I have W set goes to um, W two set bar set square um, smoothly extends to a map from C two C two zero to T star S2 minus S2, where I, here I think of S2, here I interpret as a um, uh, zero section. So, so it's, and so, so this is really two to one. So, so <clears throat> And if you have here if the, the unit, the unit tangent bundle here, um, this will be pulled back to S3. And what you can also check is that if you have here, um, if you have here a fiberwise, fiberwise star-shaped hypersurface, then if you pull it back, you get star-shaped here. If I have here um, sigma in T star S2 fiberwise star shaped, so that so I have here here is S2, and then in each fiber I have bounds as star shape domain, <clears throat> then um, I have here inverse sigma in C2 gene. <clears throat>
and this is star shape. So we have here now, and um, yeah, uh, you should have one more C. <laughs> so so now it's really like this. <clears throat> so therefore. The, the result I told you yesterday that if we, so if we um, look at the regularization of the restricted three body problem uh, for negative energy, uh, also for energy below the first critical value, um, and for a bounding component, this was phi by, by star shaped, so equivalently you can say uh, the premage under Levi Civita is uh, star shaped in. C2. body problem the first critical value and then we had the regularized so we took component around the earth or equivalently around the sun and we regularized it and so we had is in T star S2, and this was um, this was fiber wise um, star shaped. So this is equivalent that it's preimage, or that this preimage you can just think of the Levi Civita regularization of the restricted three body problem. <clears throat> of sigma bar E C in C2 is star shaped. Good. So that's what I wanted to talk about regularization. There are questions. Mm. Now <clears throat> I want to mention two famous periodic orbits in the restricted three-body problem, and these are the retrograde and the direct periodic orbit. Retrograde and direct periodic orbit. And let us first start with the astronomer's point of view. Mm. Point of view. So you have the sun, and the sun this rotates, and then planets. So P is now some planet, and planets go around the sun, and so at least the eight planets we have, and they all. Do the same thing. They all go the same direction as the sun rotates. <clears throat> and then the planets 
also rotate. And usually they rotate in the same, same direction. Um, but usually it means in six of eight <laughs> cases. So Venus is opposite. Venus does this. So in Venus, the sun rises in the west and sets <laughs> in the east. And Uranus is also like Venus, but Uranus is very, very strange. Also Uranus is so that their axis of rotation is somehow very much tilted. So <clears throat> um, also we have um, most, uh, from statistical points of view, it's not so good to say most if you have just eight. <laughs> but uh, uh, general, <laughs> general, or the generic, <laughs> maybe. Uh, generic planet. Um, so he does rotates uh, like this. And so exception is Venus Uranus. And then generic moon. So generic moon also he goes around the planet, but also in this direction. And this is direct. This is a direct moon. <clears throat> Sun. So we have here the planet, which goes like this, and rotates like this, and then the moon goes like this. And this is direct. And then there are, but there are also exceptions for moons that go, go the opposite way. So retrograde moons. Retrograde moon in our as our moon of the moon of our Earth is direct is here, but I think the most prominent moon retrograde moon in our solar system is Triton, so the moon of Neptune. He's retrograde. <clears throat> as of so example is uh, Triton and uh, moon. Neptune. But you see, as for, for astronomers, direct, direct orbits are much more important than retrograde ones. So more moons are direct than retrograde. So except maybe if you're really a fan of Triton, you want to study retrograde moon. <laughs> Mathematicians are a bit different. <laughs> so for mathematicians, um, so of course mathematicians, they want, they first ask, yeah, but what is a moon? Does it really exist? And so they ask, is there a periodic orbit which does this? <laughs> or is there a periodic orbit which does this? And the funny thing is this is much easier to prove that there exists a retrograde periodic orbit. So for this, 
for low for low energy is okay, but for for high energy, I don't know actually an analytic proof of existence of this direct periodic orbit. Also, it's they exist; we can see numerically. But <clears throat> and so I so what what Birkhoff proved is he proved existence of retrograde periodic orbits in the restricted three-body problem for, for all mass ratios and below the first critical value. They, they even dis, usually they even dis, exist higher, but the proof is just for below the first critical value. <clears throat> Yeah, right. So, so for <clears throat> this is of course for the astronomer not not so clear <laughs> that the, as the orbit, the moon doesn't re need to be really on a periodic orbit. It's just kind of quasi periodic orbit, and this is actually also true for 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 our moon because in reality our moon is not really periodic. It's just close. To the direct periodic orbit, so so you have some kind of uh, uh, so this direct periodic orbit is elliptic, and you have some by Comte theory, you have some kind of uh, invariant tori, and on such an invariant tori, our moon actually lives. <coughs> so but this uh, this quad, so actually we have our moon has we have kind of three months, so we have the the synodic months. Anomalistic months and draconitic months, and th this is this we have these three because it's it's quasi pyro, pyro, it's a three-dimensional torus. Also, it, our moon is actually in, in spatial problem, so so we have a three-dimensional torus with three periods, and these are these three three um, um, months, and that that the, this this months that we have these three months, this already the old the Babylonians knew. So, but they just by, by observations they, they could uh, figure out that they are kind of looking at the series. They could figure out that there are kind of th these three movements which uh, are above each other. <clears throat> but uh, a dynamic explanation of this this is extremely <laughs> involving all the difficulty. <clears throat> so the, also let's go to Birkhoff. <clears throat> This is actually 1915, he proved this. Mm. Proofs existence of retrograde periodic orbits. In restricted three body problem um, for all mass ratios below first critical value. So <clears throat> What I would like to explain, so he proves this in the restricted three body problem and proves this as well in Hill's lunar problem. And I would like to explain the proof for Hill's lunar problem for uh, several purposes. So, first, I, it's also good to know that there exists this Hill's lunar problem because just the existence of this Hill's lunar problem is also kind of interesting fact. <laughs> and in Hill's lunar problem, you gain one more symmetry than, than you have in the restricted three body problem. And thanks to this symmetry, the proof in Hill's lunar problem is much simpler than, than the one in the restricted three body problem. And 
it's 67 about the problem. Um, and we will give Birchhoff's proof. For his lunar problem. And so let me first introduce what this Hill's lunar problem. So in the in the restricted three body problem. So we had two, two primaries, S, Sun, and Earth, but yet they, maybe Sun is bigger than the Earth, but they are, you could still compare them. They are of similar size, and then they are much, much bigger than the Moon. So the Moon was massless. And in, in Hill's lunar problem, this, now you cannot compare anything anymore. <laughs> So in Hill's lunar problem, we have the sun is extremely much heavier than the earth, and the earth is extremely much heavier than the moon. Now you can think, yeah, you can basically ignore the Earth because the Sun is so heavy, but this is not true because what you assume in Hill's lunar problem that the Moon is very close to the Earth. So that because it's very close, the forces are still comparable. Um, but M very close to E. So you have an extremely big sun. <laughs> um, a tiny Earth and a little, little moon, but very close to the Earth. Now what you do is you first <clears throat> um, you center your, your coordinate system in the Earth. <clears throat> you translate. <clears throat> After translation, uh, center of <clears throat> coordinate system E, and then you blow up, you blow up coordinates around the Earth. <clears throat> So we have here, here the, the, the mass of the sun is 1 minus mu, and the mass of the earth is mu, but mu is now extremely tiny. And so you have, we have here um, p, the q and p, and you do the, the conformal symplectic um, transformation, you, you, you blow it up. So blow up coordinates around E. Uh, so this, this blowing up, this is actually not symplectic. This is just conformally symplectic because now you get the factor mu to the 2 over 3. So this is just conformally. And to, because this is, the symplectic form gets a conformal factor, so, what, but what actually counts for the dynamics is the Hamiltonian vector field. So if we, do, if we give the Hamiltonian also this factor, <clears throat> then um, the Hamiltonian vector field does not change. <clears throat> 
and V V M we, we renormalize renormalize Hamiltonian. So <clears throat> H goes to one over mu um, two to the three H and then so mu goes to zero, so this goes to infinity, but then if you you have to subtract it here minus three over two. So, so this 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 minus three over two uh, of course does not affect the Hamiltonian vector field. This is just a constant, but this factor that three over two divided by mu two to the three, this goes to infinity. But um, together, together this actually, this actually converges. So, so this Hamiltonian, when, when you let mu go to, go to zero, then this Hamiltonian converges. This, this is not, not, not a non-trivial observation. It's, it's not, it's, a priori is not clear, yet you can get in the limit still a Hamiltonian system. But if you do this, this very cleverly, so with this kind of... Uh, of uh, uh, factor, <clears throat> then you you have a, you get the limit Hamiltonian system, and this is Hill's lunar problem. So what's always a bit confusing: the energy in Hill's lunar problem is not the old energy. So the the, the energy in Hill's lunar problem is something close to three over two of the old energy, and then you have the, the energy times um, plus uh, times mu to the two over three. This this corresponds then to the but this energy in the in the uh, original restricted three-body problem, <clears throat> and this uh, H H also depends on mu, and this this converges as um, mu goes to zero. And so if you <clears throat> So it's you can do this by yourself. So, so it's 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 an extra, you just do Taylor. <laughs> you just uh, it's a bit te tedious exercise in Taylor Taylor approximation. So you have to, to write all terms in powers of mu, and then you see what cancels, and then in the limit you get something. Mm. And what you get, I tell you. <laughs> so the limit Hamiltonian. Now, the set, now, now, no, no, no. So we translate. We, we, we tra before, yeah, right. So, so this is already after translation here. So, so we had fir first, yeah, originally, originally we had the center here, but then we do, this is just some, simple, some translation. So this is symplectic. So, so we do it here. So then, the then the center is in the Earth. Earth is now the center of the world. <laughs> and then, um, but then we blow up. We blow up this. So the <clears throat> Hill's lunar Hamiltonian this is this the limit Hamiltonian. And I just Write down the answer H to P. This is <clears throat> one half P uh, one plus Q two square <clears throat> plus P two minus Q one square <clears throat> minus one over Q minus three over two Q one square. This is to get if you do all this Taylor approximation. So, <clears throat> but let me um, give some kind of physical physical discussion why this makes sense. <clears throat> so, what what kind of forces do we see? 
So what we still see is we still see the Coriolis force. We have still this twist here. Yeah, that, that's, yeah, that, that, that just stays. So we, so we still have the Coriolis force. Um, this, is, this is clear. This is the gravitational force of the Earth. So the last term, this is a bit more difficult <laughs> to uh, not completely expect it. So what we don't see so well anymore is the gravitational force of the sun. And we also don't see the centrifugal force anymore. So these two forces basically canceled each other. So so you so you so what so so, the, so we have now extremely heavy sun. So this extremely heavy sun attracts moon very much. But on the other hand, now the sun is extremely heavy, so the central of mass is now basically in the sun. So we also have extremely big centrifugal force in this direction. And so they basically cancel each other. And so, so to see what, how, they, how they fight with each, other, with, with each other, you can do the Taylor approximation. Then you see how they, how they cancel out each other. Mm. So we have centrifugal force. And gravitational force. Sun. And almost cancel. We have here the big sun. And here we have Big, big, so this is a big gravitational force of the sun. But we have also here centrifugal force. And what remains is this third term. And this third term you can think of as kind of tidal force. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's um, not, that, not attracting. Um, what's the opposite of attracting? Um, it's repulsive. <laughs> it's repulsive. And <clears throat> this is. Um, So if you have here, so you, you have this tidal force, it's here and here. So same, it's, it's, it's like, it's, it's like, um, like the ocean. You, you can feel the force this side and on this side, this direction. <laughs> so that's a, yeah. Also this is just what remains out of these two forces. But, but then these, these two things together, they, they just depend on Q. So let's call this UQ. This is again effective potential. But actually, this, this is also kind of nice Hamiltonian system, and it's it's highly non-trivial. <laughs> so it, it looks it looks sim at first, maybe not too hard, but it's actually quite complicated dynamics. So, so there's there's no no there has no integrals, 
no further integrals, and uh, you can you can already have chaotic motion here in this uh, Hill's lunar problem. <coughs> But now there is happened something a bit surprising, and this is that we gain an additional symmetry in the Hill's lunar problem, which is not, not clear from its, its derivation. So this h, this is invariant under two antisymplectic involutions. So the four, first one is row one <coughs> from um, p star. Two, Q1, Q2, P1, P2. This goes to <coughs> Q1 minus Q2. So this is just reflection, reflection at the first axis. <coughs> and then you have here minus P1, P2. That's basically so a reflection. And actually, this, this involution you also have in the restricted C body problem. Um, um, restricted C body problem uh, also invariant under row one. But then we have a second one, row two, <coughs> d star two, <coughs> q1. So this is basically reflection at the y-axis, <coughs> um, minus q1, q2, p1 minus p. Restricted three body problem is not invariant. Under row two. And so, so note that the, these two involutions, they, they commute. Also, so note we have row 1, row 2, which is row 2, row 1. This is the, um, this is the symplectic involution. Qp goes to minus q minus p. It's a symplectic involution. So we have a set two times set two symmetry mm. for the Hill's lunar problem. Mm. <coughs> and now to find <coughs> this um, retrograde periodic orbit, so Birkhoff shoots.
So his idea is you have you start shooting you shoot perpendicular um, from the x-axis. This is um, this is. So, so the fixed fix point set of these antisplectic involutions, these are always uh, Lagrangians, and you start at one of these Lagrangians, which um, is here. Um, you start at the x-axis in a perpendicular direction. <clears throat> so you do like this. As a shoot perpendicularly, from x-axis. Now, if, the, if this orbit hits the y-axis also perpendicularly, you can just apply these two antisymplectic involutions to actually get the periodic orbit. If <clears throat> orbit hits y axis perpendicular, this then we get some, then we use. And they use antisymplectic involutions so we first we first reflect at the y axis and then reflect the whole thing at the x-axis. Then we have a periodic orbit. <clears throat> and so to to show that this, this is then our retrograde one. So to show that this exists, mm. yeah, we, also we have to show that this exists. Mm. Proof existence of such a thing. And so let me um, mention some facts ab about the. Uh, also some elementary facts about this Hills Lunar problem uh, about yeah about this Hills Lunar problem. So some facts about H. So we, we have so H QP, this is one half P square minus <coughs> uh, no we had um, also twist uh, P1 uh, plus Q2 
square plus um, P2 minus Q1 square uh, plus U Q, where U Q was <coughs> minus 1 over Q um, minus 3 over Q, Q1 to the square. <coughs> and <coughs> then this Hamiltonian has, has two critical so, so in restricted three body problem, we had five critical points. And again, here are the critical points of H correspond to the critical points of U, but there are just two left. Um, there, are, there are two critical points of U, and these are plus minus 3 um, minus 1 over 3, 0. <clears throat> so like here, 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 is, here is the origin, here is the earth, then here is um, one of this, and here is the other of this. And, but there's, all, there's two critical points, but they have the same um, critical value. Yeah, this is actually clear because everything is invariant on the reflection at the y-axis. <clears throat> and we have uh, one critical value. Yes, you just plug in this into u, also u plus minus 3, 3 minus 1 over 3, 0. And then if you compute it, so what comes out is minus <clears throat> 3 over 4 to the 3 over 2 some reason. <laughs> so this is, <clears throat> these are the, the remains of the Lagrange points L1 and L2. So the, the, the Lagrange, so, so you have to, um, Limit, these are the limits of L1 and L2. So, so you have you have the sun here, you have the earth here, but the earth is now extremely tiny. And so if it's extremely tiny, so L1 is extremely close to here. Here is L1, and here is also very close is L2. And uh, then the other ones, they are far away. And because you blow up this, you just will see these two. And yeah, for some reason, the limit, they actually have the same action. Before, HL1 was always, had always little less action than HL2. <clears throat> and <clears throat> then, if, so if you, if you compute the, the Hamilton, Hamilton's equation, <clears throat> also, yeah, so Hamilton's equation, um, These are just uh, q dot equals dh dq and p dot equals minus dh d. As I, this is dp dq, and so this is actually a first first order ODE in four variables, uh, p and q. But then you can make out of this a second order ODE, but just in the Q variables. So you, um, you remove, so you, um, you remove the P variables, but you express the P variables by um, Q dot. And so, so you, you, get, you get then a, a second order ODE in Q. And if you do this, so the second order ODE in Q, this will be um, Q dot dot one minus two Q dot two equals Q one <coughs> three minus one over Q to the 
3 and q dot dot 2 uh, plus 2 q dot 1 this equals minus q2 uh, q to the 3 and what you so what you can see here here are, here are this the is the Coriolis force the velocity dependent force and yeah this this here is is Newton's force and here is you have also the tidal force so what you what you get here <clears throat> And then you also have the energy. Um, energy. And if you express the energy, but not with P and Q, but you replace P by the Q dot, you will actually have C, also, um, C equals H Q P. This you can write as one half Q1 dot square. Yeah, this is just usual kinetic energy minus potential energy. Here's a theorem of uh, Birkhoff. So assume um, C is less than minus 3 over 4, 3 over 2. So this is less than the critical value. <clears throat> then there exists tau bigger 0. <clears throat> And Q1, Q2 <coughs> from <coughs> 0 tau to minus infinity 0 <coughs> and 0 times 0 infinity. <coughs> Solution of this, also of, also of this uh, second order OD and the energy constraint solution of one two and um, such that hmm, q two zero zero hmm, um, q dot one of zero is zero hmm, and Q1 of tau is 0 and Q dot 2 of tau is 0. So, so that we have this. And we, we are always we are always in this in this quadrant. We, we don't do something like So let's proof. See them.
<coughs> so let, <coughs> let us write Fc <coughs> um, from zero infinity <coughs> to R. <coughs> R maps to <coughs> C plus one over <coughs> r plus 3 over 2 <coughs> r square <coughs> and this this looks like this and we have here point rc and this is since c is less than <coughs> minus 3 4 over 3 <coughs> so this is you can check <coughs> and then so for R in zero is R C here. We consider the following Consider um, QR from um, zero infinity to um, R2 a solution of uh, our second order ODE of 2, and we I have to give you the initial condition with initial condition. Q1 R0 equals minus R. Q2 R0 is 0. Q dot 1 R0 is 0. And Q dot 2 R0 equals square root of 2 uh, C plus 1 over R plus 3 over 2 r square 3 <clears throat> so so what is <clears throat> what is the, the idea so so we <clears throat> we we want to uh, we want to find this here where we hit perpendicular but we we first we start moving here and we always shoot we always shoot perpendicular and then we move 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 and hope <laughs> that at some point we will find a point where we hit perpendicular <clears throat> so here we, we just so, so this here we have this um, start at this minus r and we, we shoot here Uh, solution uh, yeah so it um, because the energy is because of this because I have here he, energy is preserved and I I choose Q dot to R so that the energy is C and then because of preservation of energy if it if the energy if it it always stays the same uh, sorry 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 solution of one. <laughs> so, sorry, sorry. A solution of one, but it satisfies this, and so so it satisfies two. Two at the initial at zero, but energy is preserved, so it satisfies two for all types. <clears throat> so yeah, preservation of energy. holds for all t.
and now I, I believe it. So a priori, I don't know what happens with this. Could, a priori, it could be, happen terrible things. So it might be boomerang here around, or I don't know what where it goes. Um, so I define the following quantity, tr. This is the infimum of the t in zero infinity, such that q 2r of t is zero, or q 1r of t is zero. So I start here, and then I wait until I either go here or I go here. <clears throat> and but by 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 other three because I shoot perpendicular, I know at least this this infimum is if if it's not in it's positive. <clears throat> Other by by three implies. Uh, how R is, is positive. <clears throat> and now the first claim is that it's finite. So that, um, that I will not um, die uh, looping here around. <laughs> so that I either will go hit the x-axis or the y-axis. <clears throat> not stay for all time in this second quadrant. Um, maybe I keep maybe I keep these equations here. Hmm. So claim one. Hmm. This tau r is less than infinity. So proof of claim one now here we really have to use the equation. So this, so this is now not just some fancy <laughs> syntactic <laughs> holomorphic curves. So, so, so we really, we really need, we need to, to analyze these equations. <laughs> um, so we integrate we integrate the first first this equation here. So integrate <clears throat> one one. So then, so if we integrate the second derivative, we get uh, q dot one r of t. This equals q dot one r of zero. But this was this was zero by by our um, um, initial condition plus then we have to integrate this so we get 2 um, q2r t minus 2 q2r 0 but this was also 0 by our initial condition plus <coughs> integral 0 t <coughs> Um, this stuff here, um, Q1 R <clears throat> 3 minus 1 over Q R to the 3 <clears throat> ds. So this equals two <coughs> q two r of t <coughs> plus integral zero of t q 
q1r 3 minus 1 over qr3 ds. Four. So this is this holds for um, all t between. Uh, now, now let's suppose t is between zero and t r, and we have by initial condition As we started, we started um, shooting in the second quadrant. So we are, we are, as long as we didn't hit yet either the x or the y, y axis, um, we have um, that um, q two r t is bigger zero, or q one r t is less than zero. Let's call this. Um, now, yeah, so, so to show finiteness, we, sh we need some information about the Hills region. <clears throat> um, some fact about Hills region. So as, <clears throat> as, in, as in the restricted three-body problem, we define this um, we have we have the hills also we have um, k c this is p um, h inverse of c or this is also the sublevel set uh, q in r two zero um, u q less than or equal c and. This hills region, this has <clears throat> this has now um, other four for C less than this critical value, the Hills region has looks the following. So we have um, a bounded component, <clears throat> and then we have two unbounded component. So this is. Um, you can imagine that we you take a microscope and look at the restrict at the hills region of the restricted three body problem. So so we had in the restricted three body problem we have the, the Earth, what is now extremely tiny Earth, and uh, big Sun, and then we have here here we have an extremely tiny hills region. So here we have we have a big it's still bound with big bounded hills region, and then here we have the unbounded component, but it's now so huge <laughs> that you uh, that kind of, that you don't see it anymore. And now you you look with your microscope at this part here, and then you will see this part here. <clears throat> and the <clears throat> the fact is actually, and so so the, here the the critical points they are at minus at uh, minus three, oh, sorry, um, uh, minus three, minus one over three, zero, and here is the critical point at three minus one over three, zero. These are two Lagrange points, <clears throat> and <clears throat> the fact is that this bounded part. So let's call this k. C bounded, this here, 
this here lies in the ball of radius um, 1 over 3, 1 over 3 uh, around the origin. This is, you can, yeah, this check easily with the um, explicit description of effective potential. Of potential. And so the fact is that um, this bounded part is contained in the ball of radius 3 to the power 1 over 3, 0, <coughs> ball of radius 1 over 3, 1 over 3, around origin. region and then here we have this, this ball. <clears throat> and then <clears throat> this is the ball. <clears throat> and then with uh, Five, four, five, <clears throat> um, and this fact, four, five, fact, they give us that um, Q dot um, R one T, this equals to <clears throat> Q two R of T, plus integral zero t q one r three minus one over q r three d s. So this here is, is bigger zero. This here is um, less than zero, but this here is also less than zero by the claim or by the fact. And so this, this velocity is, is um, it's always positive. And so then after um, and, and it actually so, uh, soon after because this is, this is positive, so after some time it will be strictly strictly positive. So after some, after some finite time, you cannot stay all, always in this second quadrant. So after, after, finite, after finite time, you have to get out of this first quadrant. So, so, this, so this implies that the uh, power R is finite. So here we really need the equation. <laughs> and then now what happens for small r? Small r is we, we, we start shooting very close to the origin. But if you are very close to the origin, we have basically kept the problem. And then we basically know how it looks like. <clears throat> uh, so claim two. Um, for small r, we have <clears throat> in the, the first alternative holds. So not uh, so at tau r, q1 of r tau r 
is zero. Also, that's I. Also, we have uh, for small r, we have this situation. And not this. So we know after some time we either hit the y-axis and the x-axis. But I say for small r, we will actually hit the, the y-axis. Mm. Not this situation. I should keep this. Hmm. And uh, the proof is just um, so close to close to origin. We have Kepler problem close to origin. Here's another problem. Then you will. If you're very close to the Earth, you will feel the gravitational force of the Earth and all the sun and so it doesn't matter. <clears throat> then we have basically a Kepler problem. So now let's introduce, <laughs> so let's claim two. Next quantity. <clears throat> so we Define rho is the infimum of R in zero R C. Uh, recall that this R C this is just this is just uh, this is just here. Also, so we we we, sh we we do this as long as we are in this bounded component of the Hills region. <coughs> This length, this here is RC, and I do this I do this as long as I'm here. Hmm. Um, I define the the first the first R where I will have a collision. <clears throat> I will have Q1 R tau R equals zero. Q2 R how r also zero, so both are zero. So that means we have and um, we are we collide. Like this, mm. and so a priori we don't know if um, if this really happens. So we will, uh, this will actually happen. So be, somehow Birkhoff gives you more than you want. Since he 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 proves he proves that you actually at one point will get will get such a collision, which is also a, a interesting orbit. But uh, and, and somehow to to carry out his proof, he needs he needs this fact that he has this collision. And that's so his so his proof does not work for the. For the direct orbit, but it's not actually that the direct orbit does not exist. But maybe this does not exist. So, uh, so because he gives his proof gives much more than he I, at the end actually wants, and so that's it's hard to generalize because all these these additional things he gets, we probably don't get in the direct case. And so if if R. Also if if this if this if this set here is empty, um, set rho equals R C. A priori we a priori we don't know. <clears throat> and now the next claim is
in 3 uh, for all R in <coughs> 0 row we have Q1 R tau R is 0 so that um, we don't Also we don't have a thing like uh, we don't have this that we that we first hit the, the x-axis we will other this is not but we will have this we will have a big there. <coughs> um, as a proof of claim three hmm. I set R zero this equals the infimum of the <coughs> R in zero row um, Q two R tau R is zero. So the first R where I where I will have this um, if if it if it exists if um, R in zero row um, so that Q two R tau R is zero is not is not empty if such if such an R exists and we put, set it row else. And so to show the claim, I actually want to prove that R0 is a row, that it does not, it does not happen. Zero is, is, is bigger zero because for small r we, we first hit the y-axis and to show is r zero is rho and we argue by contradiction so otherwise. Otherwise, we have, we have the following situation. We, 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 start, we first have this, but then, yeah, we don't know. Maybe it might go like this after some time. And then, <coughs> for r less than r0, and then at r equals r0, we have to have this situation, where we once are tangent to the x-axis, <coughs> r equals r0. So we have then um, the following situation. We have Q2 R0 tau R0. Um, it's, it's here. Also here is um, Q2 R0 tau R0. This is 0. Q2 um, dot R0 tau r0, this is 0, and also because it's tangent, also the, um, and we come from above, we have q dot dot, 2 r0, tau r0, this is bigger or equal 0. But, as a, by proof of claim one, we know that q dot r0 1 tau r0 is bigger zero and this this contra if you look at this um, the second equation here you get contradiction contradicts 
second equation in one. Claim three. Hmm. And now I need one. I want to show. I want to show that row zero rho is actually less than R C. Um, So that we actually have that. So this this is now the exist. We want to prove the existence of this collision. less than RC <clears throat> and to do that I go to the complete extreme I go to the last point to RC as I consider QRC so we have this as initial condition Q1 RC 0 this is minus RC here and then I have Q2 RC0 this is 0 and Q dot RC1 0 is 0 and Q dot RC2 0 this is a square root C plus 1 over RC um, plus 3 over 2 RC square, but by definition of RC, this is this is zero. So yeah, this is if you, if you, the, the boundary the boundary of this Hills region, this this you can interpret as the zero velocity curves. These are the the points where the velocity is zero. Hmm. So we have here actually velocity is completely zero. <coughs> And then, if we use um, equation one, one we get in addition that um, q dot dot of two r c at zero this equals um, minus two q dot one r c of zero minus. <coughs> Q2 RC of 0 divided by Q RC 0, 3, that this is also um, 0. <clears throat> so we have also second derivative is 0. Now, to see what happens, we have to look at the third derivative. <laughs> so this is a quite tough proof. So Birkhoff has to go up to the, the third derivative differentiate um, one but now if we differentiate we can but we use that some of the thing some quantities are already zero so we use um, q2 um, rc zero is zero and also um, q dot one RC of zero.
So we get that q dot 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 2 rc of 0 this equals minus 2 q dot dot 1 rc of 0 <coughs> and if you use the first equation so we have 2 uh, q dot 2 rc of 0 minus q 1 rc of 0 3 minus 1 divided by um, q rc of 0 3 and so this here is 0 this here equals minus rc and this here is equals 1 divided by rc to the 3 so we get this is rc uh, rc um, 3 minus 1 over rc to the 3 And so recall, what was RC? So uh, RC was the um, first root of the of FCR, the polynomial, uh, the function C plus one over R plus three over two R square from <coughs> zero infinity to r and um, fc has a unique so, so c is less than minus 3 over 4 3 over 2 that implies that FC has a unique non-degenerate minimum this is RC this is FC R <coughs> So what, namely, what you would have, just side, so if c equals minus 3 over 4 over 3 over 2, then you would have this situation. Mm. Then you would have a, here, with here touch. Mm. And so it follows that mm, um, rc is less than 1 over 3, 1 over 3 for c less than minus 3 over 4, 3, 2. And in view of that, so you see that q dot 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 2 of 0 is actually less than 0. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it's a bit tough proof of here. Um, but so what, what, what did we see? As a, what, let, let's summarize what we have seen. Really going to the third derivative. Hmm. So summarizing. We have um, Q2RC of zero is zero, <coughs> q dot two rc of zero is zero, q dot dot of two rc of zero is zero, 
and the first non-zero term is the third derivative. This is less than zero. So we go a bit below. So there exists epsilon bigger zero <coughs> such that Q2RC of t is less than zero for t in zero epsilon. And then, because of this, we see that if we, if we are very close to R C, we have we have then we go first a bit above, but everything is continuous, so we, we also go have to go below, and that then shows that um, as, as assumed by contradiction. that um, rho equals rc Then by claim three, <clears throat> we know that for all r less than rc, <clears throat> q1 r tau r is zero. So we have here minus rc, so we have here minus r, so we have um, this. <clears throat> so that means that <clears throat> Q2RT is bigger or equal to zero for all T in zero now R r less than rc. <clears throat> that means that there exists <clears throat> epsilon bigger or equal zero such that um, tau r is bigger or equal epsilon for all r less than rc. <clears throat> and that, so we have and q2rt is bigger or equal zero for all T in zero epsilon and this contradicts star. So so rho is rho is not RC. <clears throat> so that so the, so what we now proved is the existence of this collision. <laughs> so, so actually we are not at the end we don't want this collision, but this is the, what the proof provides us. <clears throat> so we had, so this is now claim four. And now we have, so now we know that if we start minus rho, <clears throat> we have here um, Q rho tau rho so coll collides. And then if we do R just, bef just before, we didn't have collision yet, so, so we still hit the x-axis, but now we are very close to the collision. Then if we are very close to the collision, we again have the Kepler problem. And then we can see what, 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 it, what it's doing here. <clears throat> so for zero, less than, um, so 
are very so close to rho, we have this minus rho, and here we have minus, uh, minus r. Here is the here is the Earth, and now then we have an orbit which makes almost collision, so it goes like this. <clears throat> so we have here Q R tau R. And in particular um, the Q the Q dot the because it's almost this goes this so the Q dot here is, is negative. It goes it goes down. <clears throat> So we have um, Q dot of R to tau R is negative. And on the, so that's if you are very close to rho. <clears throat> now if you are very close to zero, then, then we, have, we also have almost a capital problem. <clears throat> So for zero less than r equal rho close to zero, there we have this situation. We start here and then we have a orbit like this. So here we have q dot two r tau r is bigger zero. So now we have this, this derivative is once bigger zero and once less than zero, but it's a continuous function of r. Now by the intermediate value theorem, it has to be zero once. <clears throat> so in intermediate value theorem, there exists R in zero row such that <clears throat> Q dot two tau R equals zero. So we are, we are perpendicular. This. And this, this proves the theorem. <laughs> so that's how, and the thing is, Quite good, 1915, because this, this actually, there yeah, some version of the Weinstein conjecture, e even for even for a non-compact manifold, because there's, it can take out the collisions. So he, uh, a quite quite subtle argument, but 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 so, um, Birkhoff proved this existence of this. Retrograde orbit, and <clears throat> so I did. I did this just for the <clears throat> for the um, Hill's lunar problem. Birkhoff has an other argument, which is even more involved <laughs> than this, to also do the existence of the retrograde for the actual restricted three-body problem. So what what Birkhoff uses there? There you have you have one symmetry less. So, so, so you, you don't have the symmetry at the y-axis. And so what Birkhoff does, he does kind of double shooting. He shoots from the left and the right, and then has to make sure that, you, um, that, you hit, that they hit the um, same angle uh, once. Um, so, yeah, I didn't explain this because if you if you're a numerical analyst, <laughs> you, um, you can basically follow this idea here. So, so you, don't, you don't need to go as far as Birkhoff to actually go to the collision. You, you just need 
what you need to check is you go um, you go your first above and then you although you start shooting here your first your first uh, angle like this and then you you continue at some point you will angle, have angle like this then you know somewhere in between you had to have be perpendicular and then you you make your steps by size smaller and then you find this so the, the um, it's it's very easy actually to to numerically find these things but um, of course, if you if you do this numerically, you just do it. You have to fix an energy, and you have to you fix a mass ratio, and so on. And then you don't know if this really works. You just let the computer do and see. Okay, it's good. But here, Birkhoff really gives an argument that it that it works. Mm -hmm. And um, for the direct one, for the di for the direct one, you can you can also do it numerically. You can also shoot in the opposite direction. But Birkhoff's proof does not work. So there is no, there is no, uh, no, uh, no proof that you always get the direct one. And so Birkhoff made a conjecture. <laughs> so Birkhoff conjectured that um, the retrograde periodic orbit bounds the disk like global surface of section. And then, if this conjecture is true, then by Brouwer fixed point theorem, the Poincare term map has to have a fixed point, and that's then the direct one. So he wants to prove to prove existence of the direct one via um, via this like global surface of section for the retrograde, and the retrograde he has. Below, low first critical value. Retrograde bounds global surface of section. <clears throat> and this this is after Levi Civit regularization. Because uh, if, if you don't regularize, so, so to find the retrograde, has, you don't need to regularize to find the retrograde. This doesn't have no collision. But for the for the global surface of section, you have to regularize, and so after levi the regularization. And so it, um, I would like to ask two more questions. <laughs> and so the first question is a systolic question. So um, now the holomorphic curves seem to, because everything is contact, so it seemed to fit to this problem. And so now the following questions is, First, is the retrograde the system? Is it the short? The, is the shortest action? Also, here the, or the shortest period, but period after regularization. So, so it's it's the it's the reap period. So, 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 but this you always have action. So, um, question one is retrograde. Um, system. Then, then this see this fast finite energy planes cannot cannot break. You have compactness. Mm. And question and question two 
is so both questions are kind of independent, but both questions could be used to prove this conjecture. Mm. Question two is is um, as a restricted three body problem, as a, the Levi Civita regularized uh, is Levi Civita. body problem below a first critical value dynamical convex and so now there is a Something you can try to do is so because Levi Civita um, embedding gives you already a star shaped <laughs> hypersurface, then you can ask when is this star shaped already convex? And When is, hmm, so I take this L inverse of you know, C E bar um, for C less than H, less than the first critical value, um, this in C2 convex. And so, so this, and so maybe we should also put here mu, the mass ratio, so, and also, so h also depends on mu, and actually also the, the first Lagrange point depends on mu. Mm. And it, there I can tell you something, so it's, um, so we have, now we have, so we have two parameters, we have this c and this mu, and we have here so here is this um, this line, this is this um, H uh, mu L one mu. This is the critical value. It also depends on mu. And then what we know is here is convex. The yellow part is probably convex. So here you can prove, but here is difficult to, to check. Uh, here you can show that it's not convex. So what is this feature? So this is, so, so I, I have here, I have here, here I draw the, the, the C, and he, here I draw the mu. This goes from zero to one. This is the mu axis. And so I, so, so I ask, given C and mu, is this here convex or not? And here, if, if we are in the red set, it's convex. If we are in the blue set, it's not convex. And in the yellow, probably convex. Probably convex. So this is this was kind of a surprising that already here for mu equals zero, you're not always convex. Because mu equals zero, this is, this is where the, there's no earth. 
So this is just the Kepler problem in rotating coordinates. And it, in the Kepler problem with rotating coordinates, you can, act, you can see all periodic orbits. So, so you know the periodic orbits in the Kepler problem. These are, the, these are circles and ellipses. <clears throat> and then, but now you rotate the coordinates. So um, now not everything is, is uh, periodic anymore because just if the period of the ellipse is a rational, rational multiple of your rotation, then you get periodic orbits. But you can compute all Conley centering, this is here. And then, then it's, it's dynamically convex, and you actually see that this, the retrograde is, is the unique um, periodic orbit of Conley centering X3. Mm. And here is also quite interesting in this, in here for this uh, rotating Kepler problem, there is a different embedding. There is a different embedding which makes it actually convex. So the, um, yeah. So yeah. things still, things still but somehow now with all these holomorphic curves and these old questions in this celestial mechanics somehow boil down to questions of some systolic questions and some embedding problems. So that gives somehow. These are other questions that I studies a lot in symplectic topology. What is what is the systol? What is the what what the, when can you embed? And what, what what do you know about embeddings? And so so somehow these these are all all very much related now to this restricted three-body problem. I think there are many things to do. 